today to our, thank you, Holly. Mm -hmm. I want to welcome everyone today to oh, our um, Hepatitis B Echo. We do, as you all know, we do these echoes every month, and this is our October echo session. Um, my name is Shari Cohen. I'm the president of the Hepatitis B Foundation. We are really excited today. We have a, an expert speaker with us, Dr. Anand Mehta, who's going to be talking about hepatitis B and liver cancer biomarkers. Um, but before we jump on in, I wanted to give folks in, um, everyone in the room who's participating a chance to introduce yourself in the chat box. So if you go into the chat, if you can put your name and your either your affiliation or institution, that would be great. So we can all see who's in the room. Um, I also wanted to give a chance for our expert advisors to introduce themselves, but I, I'm trying to look and see. I think we have, um, we do have Dr. Myra Rutland. Myra, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Well, good morning, everybody. Or well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Rutland. I am the Director of Infectious Disease and Community Outreach here at Spectrum Health Services. I am so grateful for this platform. I have learned tremendously and have wholeheartedly embraced the mission to identify patients living with hepatitis B and or vaccinate those who have not been vaccinated. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutland. Makes, makes us feel so good. Uh, thank you. And then as the other um, expert advisors jump on, I will take a chance to introduce them or have them do self introductions, but, oh, and here comes one now. I'm gonna put Dr. Finkel on the spot as soon as he jumps in. I see he is still here. We go. Hi, Dr. Finkel. Thanks for joining. We were just Hi. at the we were just at the point where we were having our expert advisors introduce themselves. Do you want to do a quick intro? Sure. Uh, John Finkel, hepatologist at Jefferson in Philly. Sorry, I'm a little late covering hospital this week. Not at all. Thank you so much for joining. So with that. I'm going to um, hand it over to our expert speaker for the day. He's going to give um, a presentation on biomarkers, particularly focused around liver cancer. And then um, we will have a chance for a Q&A. We may, if we have time, we'll do a case presentation that we, we do have too. If we don't have time, we'll throw them into the next session. So not to worry. Um, I do want to make sure we have a good discussion over biomarkers. So I'm going to turn it over in a second to Dr. Anand Mehta for our presentation today. Dr. Mehta is the endowed chair and smart state chair, I love that, um, in proteomic biomarkers and a professor at the Medical University of South Carolina College of Medicine. Dr. Mehta specializes in identification and testing of biomarkers for early detection of liver cancer. Um, the work he's done leading his lab has developed to a method referred to as glycoproteomics, which we talk about all the time here at the Blumberg Institute, because before, um, before he went down to South Carolina, Anand was here it, as a professor here um, and did a lot of the biomarker discovery work here. We were so, so proud and so excited to see a lot of the work he's been continuing with. And he had, his work has led to the identification and patent of over 30 serum glycoproteins um, that, that um, have, or, and a lot of them have already been in use clinically in China for the direction, for the detection of liver cancer and others are being used in the US for detection of end-stage liver disease. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Maida and I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. On and you're muted, just so you know. Yep, sorry. There you go. Um, so hopefully everybody can see these slides. Uh, so I was just saying it's yeah. an honor really to give this and I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. So I was going to talk kind of briefly about you know, the general aspect of biomarkers, what's currently out there for liver cancer, um, what's coming, um, so, some experimental things, but really kind of keep it general to allow us to have a discussion. And, and I threw in some, you know, some math a little bit modeling to kind of get an understanding of of what some of these numbers mean. And I apologize if some of it's very general. Um, and 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 I wasn't fully completely sure of, of what the audience would be. So I, I kind of kept it kind of general, but kind of specific. So we'll we'll span the gamut. And please, if you have any questions, just just ask ask right away. I I, I don't mind that. I actually prefer that. Um sorry. So um so one thing we know about liver cancer. And so liver cancer 
can be the end stage of a chronic infection with hepatitis B. Um, you know, I think in the past, when, you know, Barry Blumberg first discovered hepatitis B and developed a vaccine for it, we thought the hepatitis, we thought the hepatitis, the, the hepatocytic carcinoma numbers would go down. They didn't, uh, mainly because of hepatitis C. When uh, uh, Pharmacet and eventually Gilead and others developed cures for hepatitis C, we thought the rate of HCC driven by uh, HCV would, would cause a drop. It didn't. Um, and the rates and numbers of uh, of HCC continue to rise, um, now being driven primarily by uh, fatty liver disease. Um, however, still dramatically impacted by viral hepatitis in the U.S. especially. And it's now being predicted by, by us and by others that by 2035, uh, hepatocytic carcinoma and to a certain extent cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma will become the third leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. Um, greater than prostate cancer, um, greater than breast cancer. Um, and, you know, if the modeling is correct, we see lung cancer rates dropping dramatically. Um, pancreatic cancer and, and, and liver cancer are going to become two of the leading causes of cancer-related death in the U.S., which is shocking and, and also quite surprising. So it's a major public health issue. And this is important because the one thing we know about uh, both hepatocytic carcinoma to a certain extent, cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, but primary liver cancer is that um, early detection is absolutely essential. Now that's probably kind of true for most cancers, um, but honestly, the data for, for hepatitis or carcinoma is really pretty clear. And it's really due to the fact that we don't have very good chemotherapeutic options for, for hepatitis or carcinoma. It's surgical resection. And so if you can detect the cancer early, you can resect it. Uh, and patients have usually an overall survival of greater than 60 months. And that's true pretty much regardless of etiology, assuming you've got good liver function. Um, but if you catch it at a later stage where it's three centimeters, five centimeters, 10 centimeters, um, overall resect, overall survival can be quite poor, often less than 20 months. And so that's that's the big dilemma. So for the, you know, uh, 45,000 plus people that get liver cancer every year, 60% of who are detected late, um, you know, they are at risk of very poor overall survival. And we can dramatically improve that. We know if we just catch that those patients early. And, that, and that's a, a, a big goal. And um, so I'm going to go over some con general concepts that some of you may know, but generally for an idea of a biomarker, and I took this right from Wikipedia to make it easier. A biomarker is anything um, that, is indicative of a, of a biological state or condition. So if you have a biomarker in uh, liver cancer, you want something that is found in some peripheral fluid, blood, urine, whatever, that is indicative of that tumor. And that's kind of what we want to look for. So we want a biomarker that can help identify those people who potentially have liver cancer and then can be brought in for further evaluation and or further, uh, and then or potentially treatment. So another term that I think is, is going to be used throughout this talk is this idea of sensitivity or true positive rate. That's simply how many people with the condition truly have that condition. So for example, if the sensitivity is 50%, that means in the study, this test detected 50% of the people who had the condition, but also missed 50% of the people who had the condition. And is that good? Is that bad? Well, we'll kind of look at those numbers. Specificity of false positive rate is how many people uh, without the condition were correctly classified as being without the condition. So for example, if you've got a study where you've got 100 people who don't have liver cancer, you want your test to not detect any of them. But oftentimes you'll detect, you'll accept a false positive rate of say five or ten percent, because you know it's it it's not it's not that bad to screen a few people that don't have it to make sure you're identifying those that do, and so you don't miss anybody. The impact of incident rate affects what's more important. So the incident rate is the true population, the true percentage of that that condition in the given population. So, for example, um, the incident rate of hepatocytic carcinoma in those patients that have cirrhosis 
um, is anywhere from one to six percent per year. That's a high incident rate. And so, um, you know, that requires surveillance. The incident rate, for example, of uh, ovarian cancer is very, very low. And so that dramatically impacts what you need a test to do to actually uh, be useful clinically. Um, so the ASLD, which is the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, um, every year puts out uh, uh, practice guidelines on the surveillance, diagnosis, and treatment of, of patients with hepatic cell carcinoma. And um, it's generally written by, by a group of hepatologists. This one, actually this year, is written by uh, a colleague, a longtime colleague of ours, Amit Sangal, uh, as well as Jorge, who is now at Penn, who was at UT Southwest for a long time. And um, what they recommend is, what they've recommended for years, is biannually, so every six months, um, surveillance of patients that have either uh, cirrhosis or hepatitis B with certain criteria, and we'll get to that in a second. And the rationale behind that is this figure. This is figure three of that paper, where they show that patients that have um, that have um, in the green line up here that have um, active surveillance uh, and have been screened and have been uh, caught by screening um, have overall survival rates of, of of five years of almost 70 odd percent. That's fantastic. Um, those patients that that um, that get later cancers um, still have good survival rates, but it's much lower. And then those patients that are that are caught with a later stage cancer, um, do very poorly, whether they're found or not. It's just uh, it's just a fact of life. And so, the goal for any biomarker, for any screening paradigm or surveillance paradigm, is to catch these cancers and catch them early, where you have early detection of early lesions that you can then surgically resect and give people um, a chance at a nice long life. That's the goal of any biomarker. Um, the one thing I like about the first author in this application, Amit Singhal, is that he's always considerate of the idea that any biomarker has both benefits and harms. And so um, you want to make sure you minimize the harms and that the benefits outweigh the harms. And I think we often look at a biomarker as, um, well, what's the harm if you detect people with cancer? But you know, when you have a false positive, when you falsely identify a patient with uh, a cancer, um, that has dramatic impact. I mean, that, that's a stress and a strain as well as a, a, a burden on the healthcare system that um, is not good. And I think that's, it's a consideration that in the past we have not included in things that I think is now being brought into the, the lexicon of what good guidelines are being put forth really by, by the stuff that Amit has been doing for, for many years. And I, and I appreciate that. So the current guidelines for surveillance uh, are still those with um, with cirrhosis at any age, and that's due to anything. So if it's an alcohol-induced cirrhosis, if it's NASH-induced cirrhosis, or if it's hepatitis C or hepatitis B, um, it's cirrhosis. And then specifically people who fall into these categories who are HPSAG positive um, and fall into these categories of criteria that regardless of cirrhosis, they're at an elevated risk. Now that risk is lower. Um, and I know if, if Dr. Block was here, he would dispute that because we've always argued about this, but um, it's lower, but it's still a risk and those should be surveyed every six months. So every six months, um, uh, patients who are at in this categories should be screened for the presence of liver cancer. And the current guidelines are, um, are ultrasound or ultrasound plus a biomarker. And really it depends upon what people want to do. Um, and so, uh, there are complicated guidelines, and I won't go over this. If the 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 the, the, the clinicians on the on the panel know this probably well, and and I think can can read it, but but it's really ultrasound or ultrasound plus a biomarker. And um, the question is 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 that good enough? Um, do we need new biomarkers? Do we need another paradigm? And that's always been sort of the question that's out there. There are people that will tell you that AFP is terrible. Um, there'll there'll be people that tell you that AFP is great. 
and there'll be people that'll tell you that ultrasound is terrible and there'll be people that'll tell you that ultrasound is great. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. And I think um, the data is not as strong for most things that you as you would think. Um, but there is general a general idea of, of what you get with this current screening paradigm of ultrasound or ultrasound plus AFP. Um, ultrasound clearly has benefits. Um, you know, it's it's inexpensive. It's much cheaper than an MRI or CAT scan. It's not invasive. It's in a lot of places. The disadvantage has always been that it's operator dependent. There's a question of obesity um, impacting ultrasound. Um, people have often pointed out that that in the U.S. Um, it's done by a radiology technician and not as a bad radiologist, and that could impact the, the true sensitivity. Um, there's always been a question upon that. AFP is a biomarker. You know, it's it's very cheap. It's widely available. It can often be elevated months before a tumor can be imaged. Um, just needs a blood blood prick, and that's about it. Um, the, the disadvantage has always been that it, it may be too sensitive and that is, is it lacks specificity, um, but it doesn't catch all cancers. And that what it may be telling you is that you don't have a biomarker for even AFP for all cancers. You just have a biomarker for AFP positive cancers. And that that's a concept that is surprisingly simple, but, but one that is not caught on as much as I think as it should have. And we'll get into that in a bit. And so this was a paper actually put up again by Amit, and you'll see my, I'm a bit of a, a fan in 2018, but really looked at what the performance of ultrasound plus AFP really is. And, you know, and again, this, I will even say is probably, you know, an optimal setting because all these ultrasounds were done as part of a clinical study at high-end academic centers. And so, this could be the best as it is, and so to speak. Um, and so, but basically what they end up finding, and, we'll, and I'll look at a little bit of the data, um, is that sensitivity of ultrasound alone was about 45%. So again, is that good enough? Is it, is a, is it ability to detect 50% of the cancers good enough? Um, when they combined ultrasound plus uh, a biomarker AFP, that got to about 63% sensitivity. So detecting four out of five cancers as opposed to about six cancers, is that good enough? Is that, you know, something that that has has value? And that that that's the question. Um, and so again, this is the data. They they looked at a bunch of studies. What you'll see is, is there are not that much that many studies. And so this was a meta-analysis of in the end of the day, a handful of studies. And so the, the amount of actual data that's out there that says how good is ultrasound alone and in, in, in how good is ultrasound plus AFP um, is actually not that large. And also, in my honest opinion, is, is not that good. And so, but we have a general idea, and that is an ultrasound plus AFP gives us a relative sensitivity of 63% and a relative specificity of about 84%. And the question I've always had is, is that good enough? And so to answer that, I will tell you, I, and, and this is the math, and I, I will add, so don't worry about it. Everybody can ignore the math. Um, so this was a, a, a model put forth by the statistician in our group who said that, look, if we assume an incident rate of 1% in a cirrhotic population, so assume 1%, which is the low end of the range, if you, were te if you tested positive by an assay of ultrasound plus uh, AFP, what that would mean is, is that your likelihood of actually having cancer would be 3.8%. So even if you test positive by ultrasound or an AFP, the likelihood that you actually have a positive cancer there is only 3.8% in a given population, simply because the incident rate is only a small amount. And then if you were negative by that test, um, that would mean that would reduce that would reduce your chance of actually having a real cancer to about 0.4 percent. And so, you know, again, the vast majority of people you're then going to be taking fourth for an ultrasound for a MRI or CAT scan if they're positive by an AFP and ultrasound is actually going to be quite low given the incident rate of the true incident rate of this cancer. If you improve those numbers to something like 80 and 95, you can increase these numbers dramatically. 
but given the incident rate, you know, you're you're still relatively low in that in that population, but you get it to about 14%. So again, it's the realization that for any given biomarker, both sensitivity and specificity have value and are important because you want to make, you know, ideally a test that's 100% both, that literally if your test was positive, there's a 100% chance you have cancer. Um, and that if you're negative, there's a 100% chance that, that that disease risk drops to, to, to literally zero. And that's the ideal. Nothing is close to that right now. I will tell you right now, nothing is close to that. And MRI is not even that. So we leave that for what it's worth. Um, so that's currently what we're all on. So it's up, you know, I think that's a good discussion. Is that good enough? And 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 I would say no. And I think we can we can have an argument about that. So the currently used biomarkers that are out there now that are that are validated, clinically used, I would say. Uh, or not by many people, are, are these three still, I think. And that's AFP, which was first identified in the 1980s as being associated with HCC by Jack Wands. And in fact, uh, as a trivia question, if any of you ever go to the Smithsonian Museum and look at the New York Times article they have about the Challenger crash, um, the front title of the Challenger crash in the New York Times is, of course, the, cha the, cr the crash, the Challenger. The second article at the bottom on the front page is the description of the AFP test um, for for liver cancer? Yeah, I'm a science geek, so I noticed that right away. Um, but it's been around since the '80s. It's not specific to liver cancer. It's actually FDA approved as a marker for testicular cancer, um, and it's used for many other things as well. But but it's still a good marker for liver cancer. But as we're learning now, it only identifies a very subset of cancers. AFPL3 is a sugar variant of AFP. It is brought forth by uh, a, a, an arm of uh, Fuji Diagnostics out of Japan called Waco Diagnostics in the US. Um, it is actually FDA approved for the detection of liver cancer. Um, its performance is a little bit all over the place, but it's become part of an algorithm we'll talk about a little bit. Um, so it may have value. And, and DCP is the last one. So descarboxyprothrombin, um, is an abnormal form of a coagulation factor called prothrombin. Uh, it got FDA approval as well, and it's been part of a kit um, that's put forth by um, Waco called GLAD. It's a new algorithm that we'll get into in a second. Um, that shows some promise, and I, and I, I know some people love it and other people don't, but it, it is what it's out there, and we'll, we'll discuss that. And so for all biomarkers, um, most of us in the biomarker community um, follow guidelines put forth by Margaret Pepe when she was part of the, when, when she wrote this as part of the NCI in way back in 2001. And, and we were longtime members of what's called the Early Detection Research Network. And there are actually phases for biomarker development. And I won't go into too much detail about these, but most biomarkers that I'm going to talk about now are still in these phase two type of studies. Um, and these are new biomarkers. And some of these listing promising biomarkers that have come and gone um, include things like glipocan 3 GP73, which is discovered at the center by us, by myself and Tim Block, uh, osteopotin. The thing that's getting the most traction to me and I think has value are these AFP-based algorithm biomarkers. And, and they include um, things like the Dolstown algorithm we developed, um, the, the GLAD, and now... Um, uh, there's Balad, and there's another one from from Roche that just dropped AFPL3 uh, that look good. There are glycan-based biomarkers I won't talk about, and there are DNA-based algorithms that are looking very good, and DNA-based biomarkers that are being brought forth by Exact Sciences, for example, that show promise. Um, what they're doing with them, you know, we'll see coming this ASLD, but but I won't talk too much detail about them. Um, but glipocan 3 was a marker that was that looked promising. Um, it was a, it's a proteoglycan that's part of a larger family of sulfated proteoglycans that are shed from cancer cells. And initial data identified them way back when in, in the early 2000s as being associated with liver cancer very strongly, um, both at the RNA and protein level. Um, this was the RNA level, um, but have not really shown and panned out in serum uh, that well. And so um, the serum ELISA assays have not shown really great discriminatory ability. 
Um, again, your sensitivity and specificity values are in the 20 percentile range. So it's kind of come and gone in some way, although it may have value. Um, GP73 was a protein that we identified um, at, at the center back in 2005. Um, it's, a, it's a Golgi resident protein that um, we identified through gly glycoproteomics back in 2005, six um, in, in the woodchuck model. Um, we showed it, it have a, a decent biomarker performance um, in both early and all HCC. Um, and uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately or not, um, it's been difficult to transition to a plate-based assay in the US. Um, it has been used um, and, and, and it's actually clinically and commercially available in China um, by a company called um, uh, uh, Beijing Hotgen. Um, and it's actually been validated in a large study uh, published in GUT in, in the early 2000s and shows relatively good performance for the detection of um, HCC, but primarily in a hepatitis B population. Um, it's still clinically used in China, has not been brought back to the US. Um, and, you know, I think for the for a hepatitis B population, it's something that, that someone should, should think about. Um, I think one thing we've done, unfortunately, is try to assume that all liver cancer is the same. It is not. <laughs> Um, and so I know there have been people subtyping liver cancer, um, and I think uh, something like GP73 that we identified first in a woodchuck model of hepatitis B induced liver cancer, and that has been validated in China for hepatitis B induced liver cancer, um, may be a useful test to bring back for that specific population in the U.S. if we can um, uh, find someone willing to do that. It's something to think about. Um, and so, um, so as I just mentioned, it's been definitely done. Um, in 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 uh, commercially in, in China, um, but it would be useful to have this study perform in the U.S. We'll see. Um, lastly, is osteopotin, which is a marker developed by Xin Wang at the NCI, um, and that data looked very good um, initially as a as a great marker of HCC. Um, again, the the sensitivity specificity values when combined with AFP looked very good. Um, specificity dropped a little, but it was still not bad. Um, and I know this was being developed, but has not gotten that much traction uh, going forth, and, and I'm not 100% sure why. Um, so I do want to kind of move quickly to some of these diagnostic algorithms so we leave time for some discussion. Um, and so these are algorithms that were developed um, really for um, improving either AFP are improving clinical factors to identify people at risk for developing liver cancer. And so a lot of this started with um, the REACH B study. And so we'll, we'll kind of go over some of this data and, and why I think these have the greatest promise still. And so the REACH B study was done in the early 2000s, 2010s. Um, it was out of uh, Taiwan. Um, I know Sherry if I knows this well. Um, it's been validated by a number of groups. Um, it's been debated as being good or bad or being um, replaced by the, for example, I think there's the page B and other things that have come out that that are maybe better than it. Um, but it was designed to predict the relative risk of HCC in a hepatitis B patient population at three, five, and ten years. And the variables included include include gender, age, uh, serum ALT levels, uh, HB 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 status as well as serum HPV DNA level, and that's the big thing because again, you know, you would predict, and we now understand that 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 DNA levels are a dramatic cofactor in driving cancer, and this eventually was developed without antiviral treatment has now been been incorporated with antiviral treatment, uh, but the data looked quite good, and they had risk models that could predict cancer in three, five, and 10 years. And I won't go into too much detail about this, um, but it it was was very promising and it could detect, um, you know, uh, could detect cancer with pretty good outcome in, you know, in, in a 10, 15 year period, which I think is important to help plan some of these things as this is a slow growing cancer. And so the data looked very promising. It's been validated, um, for a number of years. So for example, this one showed that a 60-year-old man um, with an elevated ALT 
and, and a genome equivalent of 10 to the fifth has a 21% risk of developing HCC in 10 years. And so you can then address that. You could start antiviral treatment. You can kind of figure things out and determine how that patient needs. And it's actually, I think, proved, uh, proved to be a very useful assay. Um, it's been validated by a by number of groups. Um, and so um, it's been improved upon, it's been modified by those in treatment, and I think has, has value and it's proven to be uh, a useful test. <clears throat> At predicting long range who will end up developing liver cancer. Um, so one thing that's happened, probably happened in the early, again, starting the early 2010s, was this idea that AFP is a biomarker that no one loves, um, but it's not going away. Um, it's it's there. I think patients know it, people know it, clinicians know it. And so, and again, the idea was that it was taking too long to develop new biomarkers. Everybody says we need new biomarkers to replace, replace AFP, but that's been easier said than done. And so let's see if we can make AFP the best it can be, so to speak. And so, um, and so that, that was the idea. And so, um, uh, Spam calls. This is crazy. Um, and so, um, uh, and so, uh, they want to know if they can improve it with clinical factors. We were actually one of the first people to, to do this. Where, uh, in fact, and we should have by patented this, but we published a paper where we show that you can improve AFP by the inclusion of simple things like age, gender, and other clinical factors. And so, um, uh, other people have taken this on and said, okay, if you could take AFP, age, ALT, and platelets. Um, you can improve it as well and, and then predict the probability of cancer based upon this. And this was published by Elsa Rag in 2014. And then we follow that up with what we call the dual algorithm where we could show uh, a simple thing where we did uh, age, gender, ALT, um, ALFOS. Um, and then we created that simple algorithm in-house. We tested it um, and we then sent it out across the country um, and so we could improve AFP from, for example, 55% sensitivity to 75% um, in HALT-C, which is an HCV study from 43 to 53, from the EDRN set from 42 to 53, from a set from, from uh, UT Southwest from 31 to 43, from, from uh, another study we did, it didn't change at all. And I'll get into why that didn't, that, that didn't change. Um, and even from Jefferson with Hei Han, where we could go from 38 to 58. The thing that you'll see from this, again, is we developed this algorithm primarily for those patients with a viral hepatitis. And so with hep B or hep C, um, our data is best in those with viral hepatitis. And it worked in some patients, but not others. And I'll show you why. So where it worked best is when people had AFP that ranged between 10 and 100 nanograms per mil. So if you had AFP above um, you know, 100 to 200 to 1,000, this, valid, this test had no value. And so that was what we saw in that UT Southwest study. And so, again, this would improve AFP a bit, but it wouldn't dramatically change its performance. If you're AFP negative, these algorithms don't help you. Or if you have AFP well above 200, these things don't, don't change anything, if, even if you're a false positive. Um, <clears throat> and so that was the, the, the main issue with these, is they're, they're reliant on AFP, AFP and for those people that are AP negative, it doesn't really have value. And so you need to just start generating new components to be put into these algorithms to improve them. And I'll also make the argument that these algorithms have to be modified to fit certain populations. Again, an algorithm developed for hepatitis B or hepatitis C liver cancer may not be the best algorithm for a, for a NASH-induced liver cancer, an alcohol-induced liver cancer. I, I am a firm believer that they've got to be specialized for that. <clears throat> and so what you've seen recently, and this was put forth by Philip Johnson out of the UK um, in, con in connection with Waco, um, and the data hadn't proved to be as strong, but this was an, a, a system where he took AFP, um, he calls the model here, um, and then he included, included age, gender, um, AFP L3 and DCP, and created a new system that he called GALAD. Gender, age, uh, AFPL3, uh, AFP, DCP. Um, and this works 
quite well. And so this was a paper published by, again, Amit, and, and we were part of it as well uh, in, in 2021, where if you looked at patients um, either all or early, anywhere from um, uh, zero to six months or any time prior to um, cancer development, you know, we could see AFP uh, GLAD positivity um, at, you know, roughly only 70% at, at a 10% false positive rate, suggesting that, yeah, you can, you can improve detection of cancer in a lot of these cases uh, by, by incorporating other biomarkers. Um, and so we subsequently followed that up with another paper um, uh, with this group where we created a similar system we call Dualstown Plus, where we could take this all the way instead of GLAD, which was at 69%, which is actually 70, to another 10% uh, with the addition of another marker that could, detect, could do this zero to six months uh, before cancer detection. And so just using a different protein. And so that's the model that a lot of people are using. And what I'm a big fan of, let's not throw sort of the baby out with the bathwater. Um, AFP is there. It identifies a specific subset of cancers that are other markers then catcher catches other subset of cancers and that's kind of what we're focusing on now the realization that all liver cancer is not the same um Yuji Noshida when he was at Mount Sinai and now at Texas has identified subclasses S1 S2 S3 now S3.3.1 3.2 um Lewis Roberts in that in his his uh, large paper in cell uh, in 2016, identified, again, subsets of cancer, five subsets. These are different cancers, and we're going to need to find biomarkers for each one and combine them to identify everybody with liver cancer. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. Um, so I'm going to kind of end there. I leave about 20 minutes for questions. Um, there are new biomarkers coming. They are going to come eventually, and they're going to be protein-based. They're going to be DNA-based. They're going to be sugar-based. Um, they're going to be lipid-based. Um, they are all in my mind going to still incorporate AFP. And I think they need to because AFP is a good biomarker for a specific type of cancer. And so um, that's a concept that some people like, some people don't. I'm a firm believer in, um, and we can talk about. Um, the other thing that's important is we need prospectively collected samples that are that will allow for retrospective analysis. That is, is you know, we need to know how are these biomarkers working 12 months, six months before the cancer is actually detected by an MRI. You know, I, we don't want can biomarkers to detect, you know, cancers five years before because that 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 I don't want to, you can't put that that benefit that that's a harm in my mind. You know, if you have a biomarker that detects cancer five years before. That's nothing but pain and 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 worry for somebody. Um, you want a cancer biomarker that ideally detects cancer six to three months before it's detected by MRI, so that the physician can then go in and do something about it. And so that's ideally what you want. Again, that may not be, you know, that may be asking a lot, <laughs> saying, hey, I only want a biomarker that detects the cancer three to six months before imaging or or at most at the time of imaging, but 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 ideally that's what you would want. And so we're, we're trying to get there. Um, so with that, I'll end, um, you know, uh, we work with lots of people. I don't need to talk about these people. Um, but, but again, we're dependent upon patients to give samples. And I, I, I can never underemphasize this is that again, biomedical research is nothing, nothing without patients that give of themselves for us to do the research that we do and for others to do the research that they do. Um, so with that, I'll stop. I'll stop sharing um, and hopefully uh, we can kind of discuss things and I can bring up the slides back if we need to um, and then um, kind of discuss what I think are happening and, and maybe hear from you guys of what you think. And I know I would always love to hear the clinicians, what they think of the current screening strategies, what they think of AFP, what they think of ultrasound. I know lots of places don't even do those. They go straight to MRI, CAT scan. They forget about it. ultrasound, AFP, forget about it. They do an MRI, CAT scan. For those patients that have hepatitis B or cirrhosis, hepatitis C, but for the coming wave of NASH, and I know everybody's saying, oh, NASH is going to go away with, with Ozempic. 
I've heard that before. I've heard it when they said it with hepatitis B, they said it with hepatitis C, they're going to say it again. It's We never learn these things. Um, so that's just my opinion, but um, uh, but we'll see. Um, Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Beta. That was excellent. I do see a couple questions, um, but I'm going to... Um, I want to open it up to our advisors, and I don't. I know Dr. Hen, uh, Dr. Quinn also joined. Um, are there any thoughts? I know we wanted to open up a, a discussion. So, if anyone has any specific questions, I could read out the one from the chat. Uh, do you recommend a specific cutoff for AFP, like twenty? What do you? And this is for any any of the expert advisors. What do you um, think about serial evaluation of AFP and? Are there any practical recommendations for Black Africans who, who are surface antigen positive um, yeah. in terms of, of screening for liver cancer? So to start with that last one, I think the guidelines do, do suggest for, um, for that group surveillance at an early age, I mean, 20. So it, it's active surveillance at 20. So um, is that enough? Think, is that young enough, do we think? Uh, I will leave that to the to the hepatologists, the clinicians in the group. I think that's for them to decide. For the cutoff, the one thing I will say that is not has not been done well is identifying cutoffs of AFP for different groups. I think, in my mind, the literature on that is poor um, and it's understudied. And so, honestly, I think the AFP cutoff would be different for these different groups. And we've seen that. Um, it, but it's not, I think, well studied and not looked at. And so, um, so I think, you know, the current guidelines are 20. I know people look at different things. I know people that use 12. I know people that use 16. I know people that use 34. It's, it's, I don't think there's a consensus. I, 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 you know, when I talk to the, my clinical colleagues, they all have their opinions. Some of them say, well, I don't use AFP. I refuse to use AFP. I, I know here at MUSC, I work with, um, you know, with Don Rock and he, no AFP. AFP is terrible. I mean, that's it. No, I'm not using it. So it, it people, I, so I'd love to hear the clinicians, what they think, but no one seems to agree. Um, I could answer from the clinician perspective a little bit. And thank you so much for that lecture. That was really helpful and always good to get a little statistical refresher because yeah. those are the things you learn for your boards, forget for 10 years and then relearn again for a few months. Um, yeah. But I, I think from, to answer the AFP question on my side, um, I think it depends a little bit on what your disease is. So, you know, if you have viral hepatitis and you're treated, I expect your AFP should be normal. And and to me, like any elevation of AFP in someone who who has their virus suppressed or cured, depending on the etiology, is worrisome to me. Um, and there was a period of time when the DAAs first came out for Hep C that I think a lot of us stopped using AFP because what you said, we thought it was going to kind of make the cancer go away. And then we started to see cancer after patients were cured for Hep C and AFP became more important, um, especially at the time of SVR, uh, for us to maybe help predict who may later get cancer. Um, in the Hep B population, again, if these patients are on antivirals, I really expect them to have a normal AFP. And I will look for any reason to get an MRI in those patients. So if, if I'm only allowed to do ultrasound, because that's what the insurance will give me, and the AFP is a tenth of a point above normal, <laughs> um, or the AFP L3 is elevated in some way with a normal AFP, um, I can often use that as a way to get an MRI done, which may detect the cancer at an earlier stage. Um, so I, I think that's that's where I've been using it. Um, and I, I do include it as part of my algorithm. I, I have not found DCP that helpful in my population, um, but in AFP L3 and AFP are, are, are pretty helpful. So you routinely used AFP L3 and do you, do you not use GLAD? Um, I don't use it practically. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, Maybe the way that I look at it is I'm not so much afraid of a patient getting cancer. I'm afraid of missing their cancer. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I think as long as we're in a regular screening program, usually we're going to catch it at an early enough stage that they're going to get cured of it. Um, yeah. And so even if we don't have a perfect test, um, if we have a test that predicts badness, that, that would be helpful even more so than a test that just predicts cancer before it shows up. Yeah. You know, we, we all have these patients who have a super high AFP in the setting of cancer that they generally don't do as well as the patients who have an AFP of six with cancer. Yep. Uh, and to your point, I agree that there's definitely a subset of patients with 
non AFP HCC that we're missing yeah. with just this screening. So uh, I think in our practice, the imaging tends to be a little more important, but I think the AFP has a complementary role. Yeah. I would also add that one thing that I, that's kind of hit me and, and, and actually we, and, and, and I'll, Dr. Locke and I used to always propose this and no one seemed to like it within the NCDI. And that is our big problem is identifying cirrhotics. And so, and that is, is most people who get HCC are not being seen by a clinician or a hepatologist for their, for their liver disease. And so they, they have cirrhosis or they've got some significant fibrosis that's unmonitored. Um, and so I've always, I've always wanted a, a general screening test for cirrhosis. Um, and Tim and I used to always talk about that and push that and no one seemed to like that, but I think you're starting to hear whispers of that come back, especially with the growing NASH population. Um, and so it's something that I, I've always proposed. I don't know what, what, what the thought is here for, from that that perspective, but um, but it's yeah, something- I think, that, I think that hasn't been pushed in fatty liver primarily because there haven't been any approved treatments for it yet. Um, I think you'll see that recommendation come and you know, it took a, a revolution of hep C treatments to get hep C universal screening, um, you know, on, on the docket for most patients. So hopefully as, as therapies come to market for fatty liver, we'll see more screening in primary care of some sort. Right now you have FIP4 as like a cursory yeah. test to your EMR, but it's not perfect. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Rutland. Uh, Dr. Mesa, for your excellent presentation. I can Dr. Ellen, can you up your volume? You're a little bit quiet. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. I'm going to use my outdoor voice. Hopefully that'll help. Um, I, you know, I, I hate to use this forum as a, for selfish purposes, but I have a patient that I'm seeing who is um, Hep D positive. She has typically remained below the 2,000 unit um, threshold for me to put her on medication. And I surveil her pretty consistently every six months with lab work, checking her um, AFP as well as her, her viral load. Just recently, her fractionated AFP came back um, almost 10 times the value at, at what it was. Um, it was at nine, and now it's at 92.0. And um, I went to the insurance company asking for an MRI and they refused, basically saying in their guidelines that it is not um, recognized, the AFP is not, is not recognized as a reason to perform an MRI in someone who has uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And I'm finding this very troubling because this is a 46-year-old woman from Liberia who um, has been asymptomatic. She had an MRI back in March and they did find a non-occlusive thrombus in an area that's kind of questionable. And her most recent ultrasound is non-serotic, but it does show the porcelain echo texture that's typical in someone who has hepatitis. And that's basically their rationale for not wanting to agree to having further study and to catch this woman at an early stage if in fact she is developing liver cancer. I don't know what to do. It's, it's extremely bothersome. Um, I have another woman who is, I'm expecting to be in the same boat, and it, it tends to be those who are on uh, public insurances. Hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll defer to the, the clinicians in the group to answer the clinical part of that, but, I, you know, from, if, if they're fractionated, you mean AFPL3, the, at a, at a 99% or 90% fucosylate AFP, the specificity is quite high, so um, I'm that uh, I'd be surprised if that, you know, yeah. I don't know why that I, wouldn't trigger. I mean, I, I shared that with the I shared that with the clinician in a peer to peer, and he he basically just blew me off, and said we don't use that, and and went to his guidelines. And what I pointed out is that your guidelines speak about AFP in general, not. Yeah. The fractionated three percent, which is very highly specific and diagnostic for um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and so now we're probably three weeks into waiting for them to make a decision. Yeah, I mean, would would the use of the GLAD algorithm help there? Do you think? And I mean, could that 
you know, if you have DCP levels for there too, you could put it in the GLAD and the GLAD score again, you know, with AFPL3 that high, that will tell, I will tell you, those algorithms are, can be skewed by high numbers in a group like that. And I don't know if that would be enough to trigger them to, to do a study, an MRI. Um, DCP available via LabCorp or Quest? I think LabCorp offers DCP, right? They, I think they both have it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, GLAD is just, it, 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 I, I can pull up, it, it's an opinion. I know it's the paper. I mean, um, so it, it, it actually, I think you could ask for, for GLAD too. I mean, the al actual running of the algorithm, but it's just a, just an equation. Um, so, so. Am I right with your patient, you know, if, assuming you have like a normal total AFP, but a high L3 and a normal DCP, you'd have like a 41% chance of it being HCC using the GLAD score on that one. So yeah. um, I think your alternative to getting an MRI there is getting a CAT scan and just saying they have abdominal pain and you'll get like a CT with IV contrast and then you'll find an enhancing lesion possibly. <laughs> um, or just doing an ultrasound every month until they get annoyed at you to get an MRI. CT with, I'm sorry. Just to get a CT with, with IV. Um, with and without if you can, but at least with, you'll pick up an enhancing lesion. Great idea. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions? Um, I, I had a question for Dr. Meta. You know, from these biobank studies that you have, um, I think one of the criticisms that we'll have with them at times is there tends to be a bias toward the more aggressive tumors um, because those are the ones in whom we have specimens. Um, so, you know, if a patient who's gone to transplant or a patient that had a resection may have a more aggressive tumor than somebody that had an ablation, never got one of those, didn't have samples. Um, is there any way that we can, you know, sort of better collect an appropriate spectrum of, of, of cancer specimens for, yeah. for that? I mean, so there are, you know, the, the end, so there, these are really run out of Texas. So, you know, the Texas, there's the tech cohort that was put forth and then heads, which are these are just pure prospectively collected samples um, looking at a couple thousand cirrhotic patients. Um, and so you would hope that they're just taking all comers based upon screening. But I still think that and you're right, that because of the way they're screening with they have people's ultrasound, um, or MRI, even in some cases, that I think they're 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 biased in the cancers they're getting. Um, I definitely think that's the case. Um, however, you know, there's not many ways around that right now. I think we're kind of stuck with that. Um, the one thing we are seeing, uh, I'll say, from from Texas is kind of interesting. And Lewis Roberts, I know, was presenting this at the Princeton workshop last year or something. There are a lot of patients that that we see when we're given cohorts that even Amit sees or Lewis sees that are kind of negative for everything. Um, and they are you know, AFP negative, they're APL3 negative, they're DCP negative, they're negative by all their new biomarkers, but they're just slow, very slow growing tumors. The pathologist still says they're, they're HCC, but they're strange. They're just very benign almost. And um, I, those I don't know what to do with. And I think clinicians are just kind of saying that. And once I know I've talked to Hori about that, and he doesn't know what to do. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I would say on the flip side, these those are patients at least that you're less worried about because they're still alive and they're not progressing. Um, yeah, I have a patient like that with a 1.4 centimeter HCC that was biopsy proven. I've had on the transplant list for five years and it hasn't grown. And we've been yeah. waiting for the two centimeters so we can get him tumor points and it just hasn't grown and all his oh. biomarkers are normal. Um, but, you know, kind of just reassure him you're still here and <laughs> we'll keep yeah. you under surveillance. So but, would there be value in um, a prognostic tissue biomarker? So for example, if you had a, had a patient that you resected um, or biopsied to say that, hey, this is associated with, this has, this person has a molecular signature that's associated, associated with you know, recurrence or um, bad outcome or higher mortality, because even with early detection and early resection, look, 20% of the people still pass away. Why? Um, you know, we've 
had patients that we've seen, we've gotten samples from that they had a one to two center, 1.4 centimeter lesion, well compensated cirrhosis, but they passed away from recurrence or from something. You know, I've always wondered about that. Like, would there, would there be value in that? Um, I think so. Cause right now the only thing we have is AFP for that. <laughs> That's like easily. Yeah. So I think we probably over transplant patients with unaggressive cancer and also take risks on patients with aggressive cancer that we think we downstaged when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we, it would be hard to get a tissue biomarker for patients that you're not offering surgery to. That's right. Um, yeah. Try not to biopsy those patients. Yeah. But I think a, a marker maybe in the blood or urine that would allow us to differentiate be, between who could get an ablation versus who needs surgery would be helpful. Yeah. So we would, yeah, we would, I mean, I will, again, I'm going to plug myself, but we would love to have samples like that. If you're ever thinking of a study, uh, um, we'd be, we always be interested in that. Uh, Thanks. So. Keep that in mind. Yeah. I know we're up against the hour. I just want to thank you so much. This was really, really useful. Um, thanks, Dr. Maida. Thanks to all for participating in the discussion. Um, thanks, Dr. Rutland, Dr. Finkel. Yeah. This is our last session for the year. Um, hopefully, we will see folks at ASLD and other conferences between now and January, but we will pick up again uh, with next year's ECHO in January. And in the meantime, Wait. if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Catherine. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to answer them too. Just send them my way. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you all. Take thank care. You. Have a good one. Yep. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.